Now back to the mundane anatomic challenges, the cervical thoracic junction. And again, I'm just always trying to learn and up my game, but that's uh, again, following Dr. Skaggs near impossible. But there is a great uh, uh, deal of analogies of uh, general life strategies in a cervical thoracic junction, which is again, one of those high stress areas uh, in the magical double S configuration of our spine. And again, uh, with this talk, I briefly want to outline the complexity of the CT junction, approach concerns, and surgical stabilization. Trivia question to wake you all up. I see some yawnings going on there. How many cervical vertebrae does a giraffe have? Yeah. Why? It's a mammalian uh, fact of life. Bingo. Mammalians have seven. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> but you all knew that. But uh, So this is actually a San Diego Zoo giraffe that had a significant uh, cervical thoracic kyphosis. Uh, I don't know, but uh, I got the slide from one of my former partners. Uh, his dad was the director of the San Diego Zoo. So C6 to T3 is the target zone. So this whole area is CT junction. And again, prevention of deformities is probably the mainstay that I think all of us can do. And again, surgery is obviously the main treatment if everything else has failed. But biomechanics are put to a test in this area. And this is, again, something that happens with aging, loss of muscle tone, sarcopenia, bad habits, et cetera. So with aging comes this loss of um, uh, alignment. And again, the spine, I, this is one of my pet peeves, is an organ, it's an organ system. Uh, we should uh, get recognition for this. We should seek recognition for this. And it's subject to aging and disease manifestations, such as Jay showed in this great opening talk today. So this is something that really hits us all. And again, we can all see this every single day in our clinics. So we see uh, TV ads for this now. And uh, this so-called dowager's hump is a, a widespread problem. And again, this talk is not uh, geared towards uh, you operating on everybody who has a, a hump at the cervical thoracic junction, but just increasing your awareness how the cervical spine, as Kojo pointed out in this excellent talk yesterday, is all connected to the main spine and with that also to the main stream of the human body and their mind. So uh, cervical thoracic kyphosis is manifest as uh, uh, man, uh, basically an aging phenomenon where we lose our alignment and the C7 plumb line starts migrating anteriorly. And we actually should all not just be spine surgeons. This is my challenge to all of you. We should be the best rehab doctors around. And we should garner, some of you have known me to say that, but uh, we should own our rehab, actually. Uh, that doesn't mean we do the rehab, but we should know more about uh, PT and rehab measures and control that also. And our LA friends have actually done that very well. So we should know more about how to do uh, uh, proper exercises and what we expect of patients to do it and put it down. One of the undertaught things is to differentiate various types of, for instance, neck pain or back pain, uh, myofascial, stenosis related, ridiculous, sclerotomal, mechanical, arthritic, or other factors. So there are a number of sub variables that I think we can differentiate far more. And again, one of my worst things that I see is having patients point to the cervical thoracic junction going, like, I have severe neck pain. And again, this is not neck pain. This is myofascial pain. This is an aponeurotic uh, irritation. This is most likely myofascial. It's very common. This is not a reason for surgery. Old trivia questions from a chiropractic website. How heavy is your head? Basically, it's uh, somewhere bowling ball size, but we change the actual load transformation onto our spine with a head position dramatically. And again, uh, we should be, uh, I think, educating our patients of how to build up their shoulder muscles, not neck muscles. And through healthy shoulder muscles, you actually have a much better head position without braces or without electrical triggers. So this is my prehab spiel. Uh, now, of course, we obtain x-rays. And I think Kojo pointed out very well yesterday, uh, getting proper full spine alignment films is very important and highly relevant. And again, standard x-rays will frequently miss the cervical thoracic junction. So plain films can be a problem, but modern imaging can be very, very, very much better, uh, especially if you have um, nice whole body imaging systems. And spiral CTs are, again, a very uh, helpful way to understand the cervical thoracic junction much better in finer detail, especially in terms of the actual joints, joint arthritis and subluxation with foraminal disease. 
One thing that we've never really looked at enough and been taught appropriately is the manubrial vertebral entry angle. So if you draw a perpendicular from the uh, vertebral uh, spinal column anteriorly and uh, mate that with the manubrium, this actually gives you a very realistic access point as you may plan surgery. And the manubrium is a very fierce obstacle that I personally think we should not uh, violate. So not missing injuries in the cervical thoracic junction is a really big deal and uh, historically was a very, very big problem for us. Nowadays, we can obviously with modern imaging have a much better assessment of this, but we should be cognizant that the standard imaging protocols in the transition zones may not adequately visualize the area. So please be aware of that. Uh, we talked about alignment yesterday, and again, I want to point out um, and repeat what Kojo uh, mentioned yesterday. Dr. Ames really did a fantastic job adding to our understanding of the spine by introducing us to the T1 inclination angle. So this is one of our routine things that we measure and document now in our patients that helps us understand what the patient is doing between their head and their pelvis. And one thing that I really found helpful is uh, one of our fellows taught me this. Uh, Bazem Ishak was one of our fellows, and he taught me about Bazem sign, which is where the C1 ring uh, chronically impinges on C2 hypertrophies and basically manifests itself as a desperate attempt of the patient to compensate for subaxial kyphosis by hyperextending their C1 on C2. So I call this Bazem sign. I think we, Rod, he's, uh, Rod's not here right now. He doesn't want to hear this. But um, uh, I found this to be a very helpful telltale sign that this patient's actually compensating for subaxial kyphosis. So in terms of treatment now, again, we talked about uh, traction and halos. In general, for trauma, for instance, uh, the cervical thoracic junction is not amenable for halos. I loved the halo comment earlier, by the way, uh, by a colleague. Uh, but um, just in halos, we've published about this extensively. There's a lot of bad things mentioned about it but it actually really does not do well for cervical thoracic problems. And you should all know, and this is an old board question, um, uh, the main effectiveness of a halo is actually the torso fit. So if you have a patient whose body habit is not commensurate uh, with a, uh, a vest or effective vest fit, the halo will also not work. But the cervical thoracic junction, the C71 junction specifically, the halo is highly ineffective. So surgical treatment, again, that's a really big deal and how to get there. Uh, the first and foremost hypothesis I'm going to render to you is that anterior treatment, I hear that a lot, um, is really not effective for the cervical thoracic junction. It's uh, very, very problematic to get to. It's actually very uh, maiming to either do an upper thoracic uh, thoracotomy, that's usually a T4 or a fourth thoracic uh, level approach. And whilst you can do it, it literally gets into tumor surgery. So I really uh, minimize attempts at trying to get to T1, T2, unless it's very clear from the vertebral uh, access point that this is very doable. Manubrial dissections are maiming for patients. They are not just cosmetically very problematic, but this is actually uh, gets a little bit hairy pretty rapidly. So anterior procedures for the uh, upper thoracic spine are a bit of a problem, and I think they're actually, frankly, unnecessary nowadays because you can do this all from posterior. Anterior plating, once you get into T2 and T3, actually becomes very ineffective because the ribs themselves shade or uh, protect the spinal column so much that the uh, vertebral bodies themselves are hypodense. We published about this a couple of years ago. So anterior plate fixation in that area can actually be very problematic just from a fixation standpoint and not just from the access angle. So these are actual cases where uh, the vertebral palm just uh, pulled apart with technically actually well-intended uh, attempts, uh, but the mechanics of this are just simply unfavorable. Again, coming back to the fact that the cervical thoracic junction is a tension-based area. One of the biggest problems was the transition of the highly mobile cervical spine to the rigid thoracic spine. And again, all sorts of jerry-rigged attempts were made historically. And I'm old enough, I disclosed my age to yesterday, but I'm actually old enough that we learned how to do all these things. And these are actually cases of mine that I've pulled out uh, where we literally had to improvise very extensively to try to mate the highly mobile cervical spine with lateral mass fixation to the thoracic spine. Fortunately, these improvisational dates are over now, but um, this is still something that all of us should know that uh, there can be significant contouring problems. 
And again, uh, <clears throat> how to gain adequate fixation nowadays has become so much easier thanks to segmental and fully uh, uh, mobile segments that you can actually really create. One of the biggest things that you want to know, and uh, Jay Pat pointed out how valuable um, navigation can be, is how to put in pedicle screws in the upper thoracic spine. Uh, this should be something that all of you are very familiar with, and I hope you'll practice that in the lab later today. This is a unique opportunity. There's some simple landmarks. And my main point about upper thoracic pedicle screws especially is to simply remove the transverse process with your ranger, and you'll see, voila, a virtual perfect starting spot every single time. But pre Planning, and this is probably the single biggest benefit I find uh, that emerged out of navigation plus robotics, is this pre-planning is very important. And actually in my ORs, we hang out a little paper sheet where we actually uh, look at the screw angles and the size and depth so that a la teamwork uh, concept of Dr. Skaggs, everybody's kind of on the same page and we have a pretty good understanding of what we're going to do and where we're going to do something. So the, the era of uh, craniocervical plating and complex uh, constructs is really over. But what is not over is posterior approaches. And I'm still not sure that MIS has provided a legitimate uh, answer for this. But the single biggest problem of the posterior midline approach in cervical thoracic junction is poor soft tissue closure. And this is, again, a breakthrough experience for me here coming uh, to uh, SSF and uh, to SNI in 2014. And that is uh, the proper closure of the myofascial structures posteriorly is essential and is poorly done frequently. So Vicryl, for instance, is a very poor suture material. And putting two or three stitches into the lower nuchal ligament is not sufficient for the high tensions. So I use, and I'm, uh, I mentioned a product name here, PDS. I tag each su suture and then sew them up at, or tie them up at the very end. So the restoration of a proper uh, posterior uh, myofascial integrity uh, is very important. Otherwise, you end up with what this patient in the top center has, which is a webbed neck with a uh, kind of a delta sign where the traps basically migrate forwards and laterally, and the patient has this deep cratering. This is a simple myofascial dehiscence and a very disabling condition and pretty frustrating to uh, restore. So uh, don't do that. So now we have cut... What what do you do with those patients? So uh, Dr. Sanser asked, what do I do when I have a dehiscence patient? Obviously, I try to not reoperate on them, and I try to prevent it in my own practice, and it's really stopped. But when we have these, we actually will offer them if they've really just become very problematic, like this patient actually revised. We actually do a, a formal posterior takedown with a plastic surgeon, we identify the fascia, which is migrated far lateral. It's uh, really surprising how far lateral you have to go. And uh, we then will try to trim off any bony prominences that we can. And we then, in a very painstaking fashion, literally do a myofascial reapproximation and duplication. So there are several packages, thank you for that question, Charlie, uh, of uh, PDS sutures done. But for me, the breakthrough was we did not have the suture material at uh, Harborview. So we had to use a different product, which simply fell apart too early in retrospect. But a slow-resorbing uh, suture is absolutely key and tagging the sutures. Patients are actually quite happy when you restore that, uh, but uh, that's a pretty big undertaking. And again, you're way better off avoiding that in the first place. So there are multiple situations in terms of cervicothoracic kyphosis and how to repair those. And again, there's not a simple answer for any uh, one of those conditions, but this is when it's a post-traumatic condition and somehow doing an anterior release if possible, posterior osteotomy, anterior grafting can work. In this patient, we were able to do this uh, from an anterior and posterior approach. And infections, for instance, uh, this is a TB case uh, of a 32-year-old physician I actually just saw this uh, patient back and follow up. Uh, this was actually widely spread around the country because it's a T2 lesion. And we did this all from the back with a ligation of a single nerve root. And uh, she's actually had a very happy uh, uh, career. Uh, and again, on the ligation of a T2 root, you can actually restore and do a full corpectomy. Degenerative conditions are very common. This is an extremely functional uh, person. 
and so there were problems. There was a subaxial uh, kyphosis. Uh, there was a subluxation at C7T1. There was a uh, impingement on the uh, rostral end, and here we did something unusual. We did a front-back uh, osteotomy of the craniocervical junction, sorry, of the cervical thoracic junction and a laminoplasty at the top. And this patient is one of my most loyal patients. He actually composed a song for me, which I'm going to spare you with. Uh, but this is, uh, you can't ask for a better follow-up um, than this picture. Uh, one of the greatest curses are the dropped head syndrome patients. And D3, the triple D that I introduced to you before, uh, helped me with this. This is going away present. But uh, the fentanyl fold, uh, that's a new thing. Uh, this is a real life situation with a severe derangement craniocervically and a C7 T1 destructive osteodiscitis. Uh, and we actually did her uh, posteriorly only at this point in time because she had uh, shunts anteriorly uh, and dialysis catheters in place. And again, when you do a full correction like that, you have to go C2 pretty much. And where you stop caudally is uh, anybody's guess due to physiologic considerations. We stopped at T7 with upgoing hooks, but I'm not holding my breath on that. We were actually going to go anteriorly, but she felt so much better that uh, we have so far not done anterior surgery. The key point that I want to make here is we did not use a dual core rod in that cervical thoracic area. We actually used a six millimeter rod and put pedicle screws without navigation, JPAT, into C6. And uh, they actually turned out very well. Um, and uh, again, with large bore rods and uh, manufacturers now actually ma uh, give you screw options that are short, so you can actually put them into the C-spine, uh, yet uh, allow you thoracal lumbar rod placements. So you have a much better rigidity with a reasonable restoration of her anterior column. And then transitional breakdowns are a common problem nowadays, especially when fusions end up at C7T1. And again, trying to get the anterior column restored is very important. Uh, Post-laminectomy swan necks are a particular problem. This is after an angioblastoma resection. And uh, here we actually went uh, posteriorly first, resected the anterior part, and then we're able to sne sneak an anterior uh, cage in. So uh, these distal junctional failures are a substantial problem. Uh, we still don't know where to stop in those. Um, in this particular patient, we went all the way down to L1. And I've actually followed Dr. Skagg's advice. I always love talking to my UCSF colleagues and um, my LA colleagues and get uh, advice from them. They're in the same time zone. And uh, we've had some SSF uh, Tuesday night interesting case discussions just about these distal junctional failures. We usually stop at around T2 in impaired patients for long cervical constructs uh, to try to avoid these breakdowns. But even there, uh, like this patient, I think, fell down some stairs when he was trying to escape his basement that his sister had locked him into. It's a true story. Um, uh, so we went down to L1 uh, for that. Uh, long lever arms, long fusion techniques in these patients are probably what we have to offer. So a CT junction is a real problem. This patient gave me permission to show this uh, because we were able to straighten out very nicely. Um, but it's a high mechanical stress area with unique challenges in terms of fixation. Uh, but modern hardware and understanding of the physiology of patients and less reliance on anterior approaches as a main mechanical uh, load bearing are the key to success. Thank you. We're just four minutes behind.